Hello everyone, welcome to Connection Bible Fellowships live Q&A. Welcome, we're so happy to have you. My name is Charmaine and this is my daughter Phoenix. <laughs> She's going to be my IT, my moderator. She's going to tell me everything that I need to know technically because I don't know. So, um, I always like to open in prayer anytime that we're doing anything for the Lord. So, let's open in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time. Uh, please bless this time. Let it be peaceful. Let it be enlightening. And uh, Lord, we ask for your wisdom and understanding during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we have a few uh, questions to start with, which is good. Um, first question, uh, someone had a question about Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 11. Matthew chapter 7 verse 11. So I'm going to read um, that uh, chap. I'm going to read that verse. And it says, it says, if you then being evil, give him a, I'm sorry, if you then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So, um, sometimes, you know, this verse can be taken out of context and used in the sense of, you know, I want that Porsche. I want a Mercedes. I want someone to, um, uh, you know, uh, I want someone to, I want my husband to act right. I want my child to act right. I want, um, you know, my marriage to be reconciled, I, you know, these different things. And so sometimes people use, uh, verses like this and then, pray and then when it doesn't happen they are disappointed uh because it's not happening in the way they want it to happen it's not happening in the time frame they want it to happen and so um i want to kind of really break this verse down and so when we look at matthew chapter 7 uh verse 11 this is jesus talking here to uh, a group of people uh, some Sadducees, Fad, uh, Pharisees, and um, others who or, who are following him. So um, I want to back up a couple of verses and look at chap and look at verse uh, verse seven. It says, "Ask and it will be given to you; seek and you will find; knock and it will be opened to you." For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be open or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone or if he asks for a fish will give him a serpent so this is jesus explaining how good god the father is he's explaining that our father in heaven is better than any earthly father and he's saying that if you ask him in faith, in God's timing, in God's will, that it will happen. And now the issue comes is that when we pray and we want it to happen today, or some of us are in such a situation, we want it to happen like yesterday. So um, we need to pray and ask in faith, knowing that it will, it will happen. It will occur. But we can't ask and say, okay, God, I need it to happen at 7.45 tomorrow and um, the sun needs to set as it's happening. We can't give God the, um, the way we want it to happen. It has to happen the way he wants it to happen. And so when we do pray and we do see verses like this, when he said, you know, you ask for anything in my name and it shall be given to you, we have to understand, yes, we're asking in his name. Yes, he's saying that, um, you know, this is what he wants. But, but what we need to do is uh, understand that God is sovereign. Sovereign meaning that he makes decisions the way that he sees fit. God also is all seeing and all knowing. So he knows the past, the future, and the present. So he knows what's going to happen. So if he closes a door or he delays a promise, it is for your good because the word says that he is working out all things for our good and his glory. So this this is a very loaded and heavy um, uh, question because yes, God will give it to you, but it's in his time when he sees fit and how he sees fit. We cannot dictate that to God. So um, that's Matthew 7, uh, 
verse 11. And if there's any more questions about that, please put it in the chat. If you have any questions about uh, faith, about the Bible, please put it in the chat. We um, definitely welcome your questions. So, moderator, do we have any questions? Uh, we have another question. What happens after you die? Ooh, that's kind of juicy. Kind of juicy. Um, because no one really knows. <laughs> that's why it's juicy. Um, there's a couple of scriptures in the Bible that talk about life after death. There's a couple of scriptures in the Bible that talk about life after death. And um, one of them, uh, I believe that Jesus is telling a story, a parable about um, this man who was, I guess, a, a believer. He's Jewish and he's going into the synagogue and he's passing this other man. And the other man is, uh, you know, a beggar. He's on the street and he has his hand out. And he's, you know, asking him to drop money in. And, you know, day after day, this is what happens. And, and the guy who's going in, who's going into the synagogue, he's kind of like looking down on the beggar. And then here we go to the death part. And they die, both the man who's the beggar and the man who was attending the synagogue. And what ends up happening is the man who's attending the synagogue, his heart wasn't right. Even though he was going there, going to service, praising the Lord in his way. He wasn't doing it God's way. His heart was not in it. And so he ended up in Hades. He ended up in uh, hell, so, so to speak. And the beggar ended up in paradise because this is this scenario happened prior to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So at that point, there was a place that was, um, you know, just a paradise and like uh, a pit, you know, kind of a, a hell kind of place. And there was just a chasm in between the two where one couldn't reach the other. And so uh, Jesus is saying, you know, in that parable, in that story, Jesus also mentioned that the guy who was in hell, he said, please, can I go back and tell my brothers what is going on? Can I go back and tell them, you know, they need to act right. They need to get their hearts right because this is a horrible place and I don't want them to come here. And... And, and, and in that parable, God says to the man, well, why, why would I let you go back? Because you knew everything they knew. You knew exactly what you were supposed to do. You knew exactly what was required, required of you. And you still didn't do it. So why am I going to let you go back and tell them? Because you, they're not even going to believe you. Because you didn't believe when you were alive. And so um, that was one kind of peek into the afterlife. Um, now we're going to, you know, fast forward until to when Jesus was resurrected. And so when Jesus was res resurrected, this opened up that, that a new place that is, is, is paradise, but it's heaven. Now we can actually get to heaven before there was no way to get to heaven. And so now through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can get to heaven. And so now there is uh, hell and there's heaven. And so when you die... If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you believe in him, you believe that he died for your sins, you have confessed your sins to him, you um, have have accepted him as your Lord and Savior, he is Lord over your life, you've given your whole heart and soul and mind and body over to him, then the Bible speaks of, uh, uh, a verse in the Bible speaks of uh, absent from the body means that you're Spirit is present with the Lord. So that means as a believer, once you pass, your body will still be here on earth. But your spirit immediately enters the presence of Jesus Christ in heaven. And so um, that is uh, something that's written in the Bible. And I believe that most um, Bible scholars will say that that is what they believe as well. Um, but again, I'm not, a, I'm going to just put it out there. I'm not a preacher. I'm not ordained. I am just a servant of the Lord and I am giving you my best interpretation of our best understanding, I should say, of what God's word says. And so, um, I also know that in, uh, there's uh, some other, uh, scriptures that talk about when someone is cast out into utter dark darkness, when someone is cast out into the lake of fire, he said there will be weeping. That means people are going to be crying. There's going to be gnashing of teeth, like ah, you know, ah, you know, gnashing teeth. And he said there's going to be worms on people's body. Listen, all I'm saying is, don't go there. 
<laughs> don't go to hell. Don't don't do it. Don't don't try to go there. It's not gonna be pretty. It's not gonna be pretty. I don't know exactly what it is, but I just know it's not gonna be pretty. And um, I say this to everyone that we all have eternal life in a way. It's just where you spend your eternity is up to you. You can either spend eternity in hell or you can spend eternity in heaven, worshiping, praising the God, praising God, being in his temple, being in the presence of his light. Or you can spend it gnashing teeth. You can spend eternity with worms on your skin. You can spend eternity, um, you know, uh, on fire or whatever hell it has for you. Um, but God, through his loving kindness, made a way for us not to have to go there. We don't have to go there. That and God doesn't send anyone to hell. God doesn't send anyone to hell. We choose to go to hell. We choose by rejecting him. We are saying we don't want that. We don't want that life. We want to go the other way. So if we reject him, we are sending ourselves to hell. So just, you know, understand that God definitely... Um, close that door. Um, God definitely uh, does not want anybody to perish. There's a verse in the Bible that says he does not want any to perish. He wants everyone to be with him because he made us in his image. He loves us. He does not want to have to close the door, but he also is a just God. He's a good God. He's a righteous God. And because of that, he cannot allow sin in his presence. He cannot allow wickedness in his presence. So um, we have to understand that, yes, there is eternal life for everyone. But I just want to ask you today, where are you going to spend eternity? And that's up to you. That's up to you. Um. And it doesn't change that, you know, we still love you. So, it doesn't mean, you know, we still love you, but you're going to have to make that choice for yourself. You're going to have to make that choice for yourself. There are also, um, uh, there's also, uh, you know, angels that's going to be in heaven. Um, there's a scripture that says that um, when we get to heaven, we uh, will be just like him, just like Jesus. We're going to know the things he knows. We're going to be able to move the way he moved. Uh, there was a few scriptures in the New Testament that speak of Jesus kind of almost teleporting in a way. Like he's in the midst of a whole bunch of people and then all of a sudden they can't find him. All of a sudden it says that he got, he got away or he walked right through them or right past them. Um, after he resurrected uh, um, and came back to show everyone his resurrected body, um, People were up in the upper room and they were praying and they were there waiting and, and trying to find out what's going to go on. And he kind of like popped in, like in the midst of them, like in the midst. He just came there, boom, just teleported, just transported, boom, right there. And he just disappeared this, just the same. So we're going to be able to move. We're going to be able to move horizontally, vertically. We're going to be able to uh, uh, have all knowledge that, that, you know, God has. We're going to be able to have new bodies. So all of the cake that I've been eating... It's not going to show up in heaven. All the rolls that I got, <laughs> I'm going to be able to get rid of those. So, um, you know, God wants us to be with him. That's why he died for us. So that we do not have to go to hell. We, he, he, wants to, he wanted us to be able to be free of sin. He did not want us to have that burden of sin or to be tied to sin. So that's why... Um, he, uh, he he came and died for us. That's why. So um, let's see here. Let's see. Um, is there another question? Yep. There's always more questions. Okay. I don't know. If I turn on... I wonder if I turn on the live screen here. Would it be like that going? Mm -hmm. I'll turn that down. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't want to start it up. I want to just go to it. I'm going to go mm -hmm. back. Yes, so what's the next question? Okay, the <laughs> next question is, why can't people love who they want to love? It's not hurting anyone. Hmm, why can't people love who they want to love? It's not hurting anyone. Well, let's see. Um, I want to uh, really address that. Uh, God wants us to love everyone. Love is exactly what God does. He wants us to love everyone. There is not one person out there that God does not want us to love. He wants us to love Hitler. He wants us to love the slave masters. He, he wants us to love everyone. 
The same way he loved us. The same way he loves us. So love is not the issue. So I want to kind of like get at that real seriously because love is not the issue. And I feel like sometimes in this culture, in this society, they take take words and twist them. And they take words and they also um, uh, empower them or try to, try to, what's the word I'm trying to get? They're trying to ignite the word. They're trying to make that word something that's good, that is not. So God wants us to love us, love everyone. But what he does not want us to do is to engage in sexual um, intercourse before marriage. He does not want us to engage in um, same-sex relationships. Um, so I'm sorry, that is just what his word says. Just be, and, 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 and again, this love everyone I know, that means like, you know, some type of um, homosexual relationship. And unfortunately, God is saying that I love you. But the sin you're doing is what I don't love. And it's the same thing if I was an avid liar. If I lied all the time, he'll say, I love you. But I don't love what you're doing. If I'm lying all the time. If I was fornicating, having sex before marriage. I love you, but I don't love what you're doing. I don't love it. He, some things he, it's not that he just, just doesn't like some things. Some things he said he, he opposed. Whores. Some things he says is an abomination. Some things he says he hates. So there's different degrees as well. Yes, sin is sin, but there's different degrees. The same, someone murdering someone is not going to be the same as someone stealing a, a, a Snickers. Yes, it's all sin in general, but God is a wise God. So he knows there's, there's, there's uh, degrees of certain things. So there's some things he just hates more than others. And I'm not saying that he hates homosexuality more than others. But what I am saying is that we are to love everyone. Our enemies, whoever it is, we are to love everyone. But what we are not to do is because of love, we are to allow um, someone to just keep sinning and not say anything and just pat them on the back because we don't want to be you know, called out as someone who doesn't love someone. And that's not God. That's not God. God chastises, God calls out, God comes to us and say, hey, that wasn't cool, that wasn't cool, you know, uh, I don't like that, he, you look in the Old Testament how many times he came and spoke to Israel and said, what are y'all doing, I love y'all, y'all are my children, and he, he sometimes addresses them as his bride, and, 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 and so he loves them, but he does not love what they're doing, and he's not going to justify or, or, or say it's okay as to what they're doing, and we should not either, if we are believers in Christ, if we believe in God's word, and we know someone who is in sin, and they come to us, and they try to address that with us, we have to say, listen, brother or sister, we love you, we just know that what you're doing is against God. Is missing the mark. It is not, you're not living up to the standard God created you to live up to. And you do it in all love. You don't do it in, in, in condemnation. You do it in love. You continue to pray for that person. So yes, we can love everyone. But what we can't do is go against God's word. Just to fulfill society's quota. And, and, and keep up with society's standards. We are to keep up with God's standards. Um, I wanted to uh, go to the chat really quick and just um, give a shout out to some people who's in there. I want to give a shout out to Nicole. Thanks for joining us. I want to give a shout out to Linda. Thanks for joining. Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so also, if y'all um, want to share the link uh, with anyone who, you know, please share the link. Get people in here so that we can make sure that we can get as many questions as possible. You want this? So we get as many questions as possible. So, um, are there any more questions? Um, this one is, why y'all hating on people who just trying to live their lives? <laughs> why we hating on people who's just trying to live their lives? I think that's funny. I love it. So, um, um, I don't know. I'm going to try to break this down. Okay. Why we hating? So we, I'm assuming, is Christian. Why are Christians hating on people who's trying to live their lives? Mm -hmm. Okay. Living their lives, I, that kind of sounds like I want to do what I want to do. Why Christians be hating on people 
who just want to do what they want to do is really the undertone of the question. I don't know why Christians is hating on people. We should not be hating on people. We should not. What we should be doing is trying to tell people about who Jesus is, what he has done for us, how he loves us. I mean, this is what we're called to do. We're not called to hate on anyone. We're not called to bash anyone. We are called to be ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. And how can we be ambassadors if we're going somewhere and we're we're just, you know, you're sinning, you're wrong, oh my gosh. Ah! If we're doing that, that is not showing the love of God. It, it, it hurts my soul when I see, uh, uh, you know, so-called Christians and they are um, in front of abortion clinics and they're calling people who are walking in who will have a very big decision to make. They're calling them murderers. They're, 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 they're throwing blood on people. I heard they're just doing all types of outrageous things that is not godly. So that's not God and that's not his love. And, and, and you know, when you, you see Christians, they, they at the gay parade and they, they yelling, you're going to hell. That is not for them to do, nor for them to say. Yes, we are to test every spirit, but we are not to judge. We are not to say and condemn someone to heaven or hell, but that's not our position. What we are called to do, though, but what we are called to do that Jesus said is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So that right there is key because a lot of times people don't love themselves, and that's the issue. They don't love themselves. themselves. That's why they're going out there in such a hateful way. That's why they're going out there and, uh, you know, they're, they're spewing this hate. And, and, and trying to hide behind Christianity. And I'm sorry, the God I serve does not work that, that way. The God I serve is a loving God. The God I serve is a forgiving God. He is a God of the second, third, fifth, 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 sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, ninth chance. Our God gives chances. Our God is a redeeming God. So if you're out there and you are a Christian and you are hating on people, you are condemning people, I'm going to pray for you today. And I pray that anybody who's watching this, pray for those kind of people and check those kind of people because they are being stumbling blocks, stumbling blocks in the way of God's, of God's work. You cannot go out there hating and, 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 and um, uh, bashing people because of their decisions because I'm going to guarantee you every single person that's out there doing that they were like that at some point because I know I was I know I was lost I know I was lost and I was out there in the clubs I was out there chilling I was out there doing everything that I wanted to do and thank God that our God is a forgiving God thank God that he saw fit to say come here Charmaine you so out of control I got to I got to protect you. You crazy because you're doing all this wild stuff. I got to protect you. And he did this protection even when I was walking in my sin. And the word, it says that he loved us and died for us even in our sin. So who are we to then go and condemn and hate on anybody? But what we are to, called to do is to love people. What we are called to do is, yes, we do talk to people about sin, but that's not our main topic. We need to talk to them about redemption. We need to talk to them about what the good news really is. What is the good news? The good news is that Jesus loves you. The good news is that he can save you. The good news is that you don't have to continue to live like this because God has a plan for you. That's the good news. Now, if we are going out there and saying that, and then the person still saying, I want to sin, I want to sin. You say, what did, what did the word say? He said, if they do not receive you, you kick the dust off your feet and you keep it moving. You pray for that person, you keep it moving. But you don't got to bash that person. You don't got to hate on that person. You don't got to tell that person, you go into hell and you're going to bust it wide open. That's not for us to say. That is not for us to say. So, um, I am sorry, you know, for whoever... And submitted that question if, if any Christian has ever hate on, hated on you and you really mean that this person hurts your feelings, then I apologize uh, on behalf of our brothers and sisters. And I apologize on uh, behalf of, uh, of Christianity as a whole because that does not represent the true heart of God. God, no, he doesn't tolerate sin. He doesn't accept sin. And so I'm not talking about no lazy, no lapse of days. Like, oh, yeah, Jesus love you. Love and love. Love, love. Oh, yes, praise the Lord. I'm not talking about that. But I'm also not talking about hate. Hate is unacceptable. Every person on this earth is made 
in the image of God. And so every life, every person from the womb to the tomb, every person is valuable. Every person. So thank you for um, whoever submitted that question. Who submitted that question? Do you know? Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. I want to give you a big shout out to Trevor. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Laquanda. Yes. She said, how do you know who is meant to be in your life if they keep showing up through your life? Especially if you had visions of of them in, as your future husband. Okay. This is a tricky question. And I've heard this many, 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 many of times about um, people dreaming about their spouses. Now, I'm not putting God in a box. I'm not saying that the Lord is, um, he can't send you dreams. What I'm saying is we want, we want to, as much as possible, guide ourselves in um, not being led astray or tricked by the enemy. And one of the ways that I guard myself is if it's not in the Bible, I kind of, you know, I have to take it with a grain of salt. So if I had a dream about um, my husband to be, I'm already married. You know, what I'm saying? hey babe, if you're out there, um, you know, I I would have to say, well, I know that I've never seen anything like that in the Bible. Where, where anybody ever dreamt about this future spouse? Then I have to look at and examine what dreams were in the Bible, what did they represent, and what were the things that were communicated in dreams. I think that um, sometimes we take tradition uh, tradition as um we take tra tradition as doctrine doctrine comes from the word of god and so if we are in a type of church where they they um spiritualize everything and um it's just kind of like their experiences trump the bible then what ends up happening is that everybody can say well, I did this and I heard a word from the Lord and da, 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 da. And everybody can go and start doing all these different things. And there's no way to, ch there's no checks and balances. So I would say, um, again, I'm not trying to discount anybody's dreams or anything like that. What I'm saying is just make sure you check it because the enemy is crafty. The enemy is uh, uh, wise, you know. And um, you want to make sure that he's not having you dream about exactly what you want. I had a brother told me that uh, he said, you know, I, he said the, uh, that Satan knows your flavor. And he does. Okay. So he know that who wants a husband. He know if you got a husband or a wife and they're not treating you right. He know who to send your way. Because he know exactly what you like because he's been watching us for some time now. He's been watching us for some time now. So, no, he can't read your thoughts, but he can read your actions. He can read how you move. He can read, you know, expressions in your face. And he knows when you're pining. He knows when you're wanting a spouse. He knows that. So, I would say check your dreams by the word of God. See what types of dreams are out there. What type of dreams are in the Bible? What was God's purpose? God just, just doesn't give people dreams for, for just the fun of it, there's going to be a purpose in there. And usually from those dreams, God gets the glory. When Daniel uh, uh, deciphered the dreams, when Joseph deciphered dreams, they all, even the, the Gentiles, the, the people who the non-believers gave God glory. So the dreams that we're having, if they're not to give God, give us, give God glory, if they're not to warn us about something that is going to take us off our divine purpose, then we want to just make sure that we're checking that. And regard about the person that keeps coming in and out your life, um, check that person's character by the Bible. Because Satan, he's when you read the Bible um, in Job, God asks Satan like, "Hey, where you been?" He said, "I just been wandering the earth, going to and fro, looking around." So Satan can come and go. He could be in your life on and off. You know what I'm saying? He could send people in your life on and off, and they may not be the right people. They're just there. To try to derail us. To get us off our divine purpose. To get, off our, get us off our divine destiny that God has sent for us. So is this person coming in, out your, in and out your life with, with, with uh, scriptures? Is this person coming in and out your life 
uh, praying for you, praying with you? Is this person coming in and out your life, respecting God's principles and ways and his will? Or is this person coming in and out your life, flirting with you, getting you all hot and bothered, uh, you know, you know, not doing godly things? What is this person's purpose that keeps coming in and out? I would say check that too by the word of God. That's why he gives it to us. He said the word of God is there for reproof, correction, is, is, is there for discipline, is there for inspiration, is there to guide us and to teach us. So we can use God's word in every and any situation we have. Because what happens is God may show you something. And it may be a far ways off. And, and it could be if that person is not where they need to be right now, then don't worry about it. You leave that person to God and you keep going after God's purpose that he put on your life. Let him continue to grow you to make you into the husband or wife for that other person that he that you um, said that God uh, that you dreamt about. You want to make sure that you are right. So even if you had a dream about someone and even if God revealed to you that this person is your husband or your, you know, um, I'm just using for men as well, your wife, then make sure that you're going to be ready. Make sure that you're, you're where you need to be spiritually, financially, emotionally, educationally, you know, and your employment's right. Make sure that you got, you know, some things under your belt that you bringing something to the table to this godly spouse that God is bringing you. So that's that's definitely something that I would um, suggest. And I hope that that helped. And I hope that it um, gave some insight to your question. And if not, let me know. I'll try. I'll try again. Um, any other questions? Not right now. Not right now. Okay, so um, we don't have any questions right now. But um, there was something that somebody had said to me uh, about... Um, what was it? Something that somebody said to me about, um, it was something like astral planning or something like that. And I just want to talk about that for a minute. Astral planning is like when your spirit leaves your body and then you're floating around out there in the world, in the skies. And I just want to say, that is not anything God, <laughs> I, I don't never read anything about that, except for two times when I think Paul said he was taken up to the... Oh, he didn't say it was him. Paul said it was a man, but we assumed it was him. That he was taken up to, like, the second heaven, third heaven or something like that. And he saw a lot of things and he came back down. But it's specific. It was, it was specific to heaven. Then I think John, you know, in the book of Revelation, he said, you know, he was taken up into the, in the spirit to these different places in heaven. Other than that, I never see anybody else be flying around in the Bible. So I just want to say... Any type of uh, witchcraft or things like that, we want to stay away from those type of things because it's in those type of things where the enemy can trick you up because you have to understand that the enemy is the angel of light. Light reflects things. And so he can reflect and sometimes look like God, but he is not God. He can reflect things and make it seem and distort the image and make you think that these, these things are spiritual, but they're not. They're demonic. And so I just wanted to touch on that because um, I've heard it a couple of times from people who are Christians. And um, that's not of God. It's not. It's not. Um, so um, another topic that is really um, interesting that I really want to touch on probably more in depth later on is um, Christian dating. Like kingdom dating, kingle singleness, and how we're supposed to be in our singleness. What happened? You said kingle singleness. I said kingle single. Kingdom said. singleness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Phoenix. Kingdom singleness. Um, because it's not easy out there. It's not easy out there because this world is so upside down. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. This world is like crazy. But if you are a single out there, believe you me, if God has not taken away your desire to be with someone, God has someone for you. But he wants you to be where 
he wants you to be. He wants you to be right in front of him so he can mold you and make you into the spouse that he wants you to be. Sometimes we just want to get married because we're getting older and we see other people getting married. But we're not really focused on the things that God wants us to be focused on. And so, you know, things like our prayer life, things like learning his word, because by his word, you'll be able to judge that spouse. By his word, you'll be able to see things. You'll have you'll deepen your discernment so you won't be fooled. Because there's a lot of jokers out there that can fool you. It's a lot, a lot of fooling going on. You got people pretending to be somebody they not, especially with all the social media, especially with all this texting nowadays. People don't even know how to have a conversation no more because everybody's used to texting. Everybody's used to smiley face emoji. Anybody can do that. Matter of fact, I text people smiley face emoji with straight faces. I'm straight faced while I'm doing it. Laugh out loud. Smiley face. And I'm not even laughing. I'm not even smiling. So that don't mean nothing. That don't mean nothing. So people can go out there and they can pretend. People can go out there and be who they want to be in this world. And this world will accept it. You want to make sure that you're so built up in the Lord as a single person. Whether someone stays or goes, it will not rock your boat because you're tied and your anchor is in Jesus. What happens is we open up ourselves to these people and then these people end up taking the place of where God should be, taking the place of where, where, where the Lord should be. And then when they leave, when they leave, it's like, oh, oh my God, my world is over. I can't, I can't take it. You know why? Because they was in the wrong place. That place was only reserved for the Lord. And so... You know, as singles, we really have to be focused. And I'm saying this, and I know I'm married now. People are like, girl, you married. You don't even know how it is out there. Let me tell you. I'm married. I ain't dead. I ain't dead. Oh, soul ties, yes. We're going to talk about those soul ties right now. And, and, as, and as a single person, that's why we're so broken down. We're so broken down because of the soul ties. We're broken down because of the soul ties. Because what we're doing every time that we engage in sexual intercourse before marriage, please understand, please understand on a biological level, on a biological level, just think about this. On a biological level, when you have sex before marriage, the sperm of the man is deposited in the female and the female body absorbs it. This is biologics. This is, this is a biological thing. This is not even spiritual. So you walking around with somebody else's DNA in you? In your veins? In your body? Oh my gosh. I don't even want to think about it. I'm so glad that when we come to the Lord that he makes us a new creation. I don't even want to think about it. I don't. mm mm mm, -mm. That's just on a physical level. So now we're talking about a spiritual level. The Bible says that when a man and woman have intercourse, they become one. They are married. How many times people out there been married? I just want to put that out there. How many husbands and wives people got out there? Because that's really what it is. That's really what the soul tie is. That you're tying your spirit to all these different people, all these different men out here, all these women, all these one night stands. Oh, this is my, this is, this is my cut buddy. You know what I'm saying? This is my booty hole. All of that. You married to every single one of them. Every single one of them, your husband. And I wonder if that's what Jesus was talking about when he was talking to the lady at the well. No, you don't have no, you don't have one. He said you actually have five. I wonder if that's what he was talking about. Because to me, that's very, very accurate. And just want to point out when she went back to the town to tell them about Jesus, she talked to all the men. She talked to all the men in the town. So they know who she is. They know who she is. They know. So, ladies, gentlemen. Understand, there's a method 
God is not just saying, don't do this, don't do that, because he doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be happy and he wants you to be safe. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to be healthy. We cannot be whole and healthy if we are tying our souls to different individuals just depending because they said something nice to us, because they brought us a few things, because they've given us attention. We want to be so built up in the word, so built up in God, so built up in our relationship with Jesus that we're not quick to feel pressured to give anything up. Because once we give it up, now we, that's another tie we have to break. That's another tie. That's another tie to this world and this and, and another bondage, another chain and shackle to sin that we have to break. So understand sleeping, having sex before marriage is not no little thing. And God knows I wish that it was explained in a more detailed way like this when I was younger. Oh, you know, just don't do it. Don't do it. It's bad. It's wrong. Sex is good. God made it. Sex is amazing. It's awesome. But it's only awesome in the sanctity and in the covenant of marriage. That's the way God designed it. Between a man and a woman in the covenant and institution of marriage that he designed. We cannot go and tell God how to design marriage. We cannot go and tell God how to design sex. Because he's the inventor of it. You do not tell the inventor what to do. I'm sorry. So, soul ties can be broken a number of ways. They start first with us giving our lives over to Jesus. Giving our lives over and saying, Lord, you are my savior. And, and then, you know, some people go to deliverance ministries and things like that. I'm telling you, I did my own deliverance ministry right in my house. Just me and Jesus. And I prayed and I asked the Lord, Lord, anything, anything that I am tied to, any, if, if it was my husband, if it was my kids, if it was my job, if it was past relationships, things, if it was things that my great, 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 great grandmother did. That still is affecting my generations now. I said, Lord, please cut those ties. Cut those ties, Lord. I don't want to be tied to anything in this world except for you. I don't even want to be tied to my husband like that. To where he got my soul. People talk about soulmate. The only soulmate I want is Jesus. That's the only soulmate I want. Now, do I want to love my husband? Yes. Do I want to treat him right? Yes. But I don't want him to have my soul. Because he can't trust me. It's like I can't trust him 100%. Because guess what? We're human. I trust God. I don't 100% trust my husband. 100% trust God. I don't want my husband. I don't want my husband to 100% trust me. I don't even trust me 100%. But I want him to trust God. And with that, this way, nothing is ever in that place. That if it is, because God is stable. He's, he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So you could put him in that place where he has your soul. And, and he's never going to leave you. So you're never going to have to worry about this person breaking your heart. That person breaking your heart. This person betraying you. God's never going to betray, betray you. He's never going to leave you. And so your soul, your spirit stays intact. But when we put our affections into man, whether it's, like I said, family, friends, children, jobs, objects, when we put our affections into this world. We are tying ourselves to these things. So right where you are in your living room, in your car, you could pull over and ask the Lord to deliver you, to cut those ties from generational uh, soul ties to, to uh, sexual soul ties to any affections, even things you don't know about. I said, Lord, if there's anything that I don't even know, Lord, please cut those ties. I don't pledge allegiance to no flag. I pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God. That's a soul tie. You got people out here tied to the politics. You got people out here tied to politicians and political parties. So much so they're, they're willing to denounce the, 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 the patterns and principles of God. Because they're so tied to these things. You got people out here. I'm in a sorority. I even had to denounce that. Yeah, I still love my sorority. Yes, I still participated, but I don't want to make no pledge to them. I don't want to tie myself to them. The only thing I want to be tied to is God. 
That's the only thing that I want to be tied to. Yeah, you can still enjoy life. You can still live life. I'm not saying don't. What I'm saying is make sure you're not tied to nothing else in this world. Because when it's time to get caught up, it's time to go home. It's time to see, to see him in glory. You don't want to get up there. Uh, what's that? Uh, uh, what's that? Something holding you back. Something tied. You, you still tied to something in this world. You want to be free. You want no chains. No chains. You know that old school song? I'm free. Praise the Lord. I'm free. No longer bound. No more chains holding me. That's what I want to be. I want to be free. Free, 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 free. So when it's time to go, I'm gone. I'm gone. So, but soul size definitely needs to be broken down um, a lot more in detail because it's a very serious thing. It's a thing that's not really talked about in church as much as it needs to be because we, we, we act as though once we get saved that we never lived a life before that. We did. We did some things and, and some things they still, they still in us. If anybody get a chance, please, 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 please. I know this is a real old school. Watch that one, Nita Bynum, No More Sheets. Watch that one, Nita Bynum, No More Sheets. That thing right there, that's an aspect of soul ties on the sexual level. But there's so many other things that we are tied to in this world that are also soul ties. We are tied to anger. We're tied to pain. We're tied to, to, to what people have done to our past. We're tied to that. That defines us. There's so many things that we need to really relinquish ourselves from and give over to God. So that we do not have, we can walk in full freedom. Walk in full freedom. Because God is the only one that can break those ties. The only one. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Patricia, for that. Thank you very much, Patricia. Let me see who else is in the house. Thank uh, We're going to give a triple big shout out to Patricia in the house. Yes. We want to give a true big shout out to LaQuanza in the house. Yes, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Cassie, hi Cassie. Oh, I miss you. Uh, um, anybody has any, um, anybody has, yes. I can't, Patricia, that was right. You said, so imagine just having multiple physical soul ties you need to wash out and cleanse. Yes, 100% true, 100% true. Um, any, um, other questions? Not yet. Okay. I'm not to log back into your thing. I don't know how to do it. What you mean? Right now, you're, you're back. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So, um, anybody has any questions out there? Anything that you want to just throw out there? If you don't want me to say your name, you know, just text it to me. I'll, and I'll see if I can get it. Because <laughs> I have the phone recording. I don't know. All these things happen. I don't know. Um, but as we're here, let's um, talk about some things that um, I would say some things that I was plagued with when I um, was kind of like rededicating my life back to the Lord. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. And um, one of the things that um, uh, I guess was bothering me was how how to dress. You know, um, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. It was very, very strict, very, very strict. I mean... I don't have my earrings on right now, but I had, I, I don't even wear like hoop earrings. I don't even wear hoop earrings because that was like a no-no. And so now when I wear them, I feel like I look like a gypsy. Nothing wrong with gypsies, but I'm not a gypsy. You know what I'm saying? So I don't want to look like one. And so, you know, it was the earrings. It was to wear the long skirts. Um, it was to wear only skirts. You couldn't even wear no pants. And, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying anything wrong with skirts and stuff like that. But this... There's certain things, you know, that we have to leave room for the Holy Spirit for. There's certain things that are straight out and outright sin. Those things are very outlined in the Bible. Then there's those gray areas. And those gray areas, those gray areas are for the Holy Spirit to lead you. That's for the Holy Spirit to convict you. Yes, we are all supposed to be as one in spirit. But we should not all be out here in uniform, in a Christian uniform. Because God, and God made us all individuals. He made us all in his image, but we all have our unique skills, our unique talents. We look different. We act different. We have different personalities, different desires, wants. And so even with that being said, we have to make sure that if we're in a body, that that body is not 
putting bonds on us when we are already free. We are free in Jesus. Paul said we're free to do anything, but everything is not profitable. So, yes, you're free to do stuff. Those gray areas, it shouldn't be when you walk into a place that, because you don't got no pants on, they looking at you like, oh, my gosh. It shouldn't be that. There should be no judgment there for external things. It should be your character in which you're looking at. So, you know, that was something that I know that plagued me. And I really did search the scriptures. And there's nothing in there except for do not wear anything pertaining to man. And then you have to look at the context. What, when did they write that? And why did they write that? That's what we have to look at. And so looking at those things in context, it made me realize that, hey, that's a man thing. That's a, a, a legalistic thing. So, you know, don't get into that legalistic thinking where, oh, if this person does this, the A, then B, then C. If it's not in the Bible, then that's man's, that's man's tradition. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, there um, is another, there's another question. Oh, there is another question. There is another question. Mm -hmm. What happens when you have one person who is not saved and lives in a worldly life that your relationship that you're in a relationship with. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that is something that is really, um, it's hard. It's hard, especially if, um, you know, let's say that you guys got together and you were both kind of like worldly. And then now one of you are taking off and you're spiritually growing and you're deepening your relationship. And the other person is still back there. And you looking like, you know, looking far because you know, now y'all just not even vibing anymore you're not even speaking the same language and and that's what's that's what's going to end up happening what's going to happen and what's going to end up happening is um the bible says that what you know what does darkness and light have in common what does one have to do with the other there is no way that the relationship is going to be successful because what you're going to be speaking and what he, he or she is going to be speaking is going to be totally different. It said the natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit. That's what the Bible says. Because the natural man is carnal and carnal minded. So if you're going to this person you're saying, hey, babe, you know, I think that, you know, I'm trying to get my spiritual life right. Um, I think that we should stop having sex now. And they're going to look at you like, yo, what you, you bugging? Like, you crazy? Like, what, what's wrong with you? They're going to start thinking you're in a cult or something because they're going to be like, yo, you was just two months ago, you was with it. You, the person is cursing around you and it's like every time they curse, your spirit jumping. Oh, God. Oh, oh. Their mouth is so foul and dirty. And now they're going to look at you like, now you're so righteous, you think you're all that. It's going to become an issue and a problem because God did not call us to evangelize inside of our relationship. Even for the husband and wife relationship, he said uh, to the, the wife, to win his to win your husband over without a word. So just by her actions, she was supposed to win him over to show that I am fully submitted to Jesus. But in a relationship where there is no institution of marriage, no covenant of marriage, and we're dating, we should try to we should try to stay away from those who are not walking with God. We're not talking to somebody talking about somebody, yeah, I go to church, like you mean when your grandma took you? That's what you're talking about? Yeah, 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 you know what I'm saying? I know, I know, I know the our father. No. You want a kingly shepherd. You want a shepherd, a shepherd king. You want a person who is like, like David and Boaz and the sons of Solomon. You want a man that, even if you're trying to come on to him, he's like, mm-mm, let's not awaken love before it's time, boo. Chill out. Calm down. That's what you want. You want a man that's going to be your banner, your covering. Before you out the house, he's like, oh, babe, don't leave, don't leave. Oh, hey, hey, we ain't pray yet. We got to pray. I got to cover you. You want a man who, or a woman who is ready to have a prayer with you when you're going through something. And when times get hard, you don't want this person having, a, I got to get out of here. I can't, he, this person can't take no pressure. That's not a man. A man should be, should be able to stand under pressure. If he can't stand under pressure, that usually means that he's not mature and he's not ready. You want a man who is fully submitted to God. 
Because I'm going to tell you right now, if he is not fully submitted to God, that means that he has not, he has not learned how to love like God. He has not learned how to protect like God. He has not learned how to, to provide like God. And then you're going to try to have to teach him that. And that's something only God can teach him. So don't bring more problems on yourself. And he said, you know, the two, two, you can't be unequally yoked. The yoke is the thing that the, the, the oxen would have on its neck. And it would be tied to another oxen. And they have another hole in the oxen head. And they're plowing down. Now, there would be a problem if the oxen, the big old oxen was tied to the to the to the yoke and then you have a small little old donkey now they lopsided they going different ways the the row ain't straight no more and the, the donkey going this way the ox going this way that is what a relationship is when you're with someone who's unequally yoked you're going to want to spiritually grow. You're going to want this person to go to church with you. You're going to want this person to to, to go to uh, uh retreats with you and they're gonna be looking at you like you got ten heads. And it's going to be a thorn in your side forever. So if you're not married and you're with somebody who is not walking with the Lord, let God save them. You cannot save them. Let God save them. And if it's meant to be, God will bring that person back to you and y'all will be together. Praise God. But you don't be with this person. If I could just show them the goodness of the Lord Jesus in my soul, then they would just get saved and then we can get married. And no. Nope. No evangelism dating, please. Don't do it to yourself. Don't do it to yourself. Make sure that you are fully submitted to the Lord because you're going to be able to see then, is this person really a shepherd king? Is this person really a Queen Esther? If these people are not like that, they're not really fully submitted to the Lord, they're not going to be able to love you right. They're not going to be able to love you right. I'm going to tell you right now, until I was fully submitted to the Lord, I was not loving my husband right. I wasn't. Because I'd be like, what dude you said? What to me? <laughs> I know you ain't talking to me. because I, <laughs> I eat him up. He said one word, I'm on it. It was only after I fully submitted to God that I could just... And I feel like no way. Because I knew God got me. My faith and everything was in him. So if I was not like that, I would not be able to change. We probably wouldn't even be together today. Because, I mean, I know I'm a piece of work. I know about nobody else. I know I am. So, you know, we want to make sure that this person is God approved. We want to make sure this person is a, a, man, a man or a woman after God's own heart. We want to make sure the person that we're dating is who God sent. And you will know this because this person will have characteristics just like God. Because they'll be fully submitted to him. And you'll be able to see the God in that person. You'll be able to see the light in that person. And I mean, at the, I'm, telling, I'm telling you, sometimes this world try to get you... Well, everybody's not perfect. We're not talking about perfect here. We're talking about characteristics. We're talking about attributes. The way someone carries themselves. How, how responsible they are. All these things. So don't get yourself tied up in situations that you don't have to. So it's about to be, uh, we're about to wind up. So I'm going to take, if there's any um, last questions, I'll take one more question. If anybody has a question out there, one more question I'll take. And um, if not, then I will uh, probably uh, close out and uh, pray us out. You have until 9.30. Huh? You have until 9.30. We have until 9.30. I thought we started at 8. It was 8.58 and it's 8.59. I mean, I mean, I don't want to stay on here, you know what I'm saying? If it's quiet out there in these streets. If it's quiet out there in these streets, make sure that um you guys are um sharing the link, you know, to anybody that, you know, you think might be blessed by this or encouraged by this. Share the link. Get them on. Um, Also, um, you're welcome. I don't know who said that. Who said that? Oh, you're welcome, LaQuanza. You're welcome. Um, uh, I'm, I thank you for uh, being so brave to, to put these questions out there because I'm telling you, you're not the only person that has these questions. I used to have the same questions. I used to have the same questions. So 
thank you for your bravery. Thank you for your uh, transparency. It's a blessing to everybody who um, is able to hear this. Um, um, what you call it? Uh, yeah, don't forget to share the link. Um, we have a, you have a little bit more time. Also, if you get a chance, oh look at that! Oh my goodness, big things. You know, my I have these Hobbit fingers. My fingers is like Hobbit fingers. Sorry, pressing all the buttons. Um. Um, don't forget to, we have a YouTube channel. It's Connection Bible Fellowship. Uh, you can go to that channel. Please um, subscribe. Please watch those videos. Uh, like them. We really appreciate the support. And I hope that they are edifying to you and that they are uplifting to you and that they encourage you. And so we're going to try to put out videos weekly, um, at least two a week if I can. But definitely for sure, at least one video a week we're going to try to put out. Um, it's usually a recording, so if there's any of the live that you miss, um, please, um, <laughs> hey, Alex, thanks for, uh, coming by. Thanks for stopping by. Um, if there's any, uh, teachings that you missed throughout the week, uh, they'll be on the YouTube channel. We also have an Instagram page. You can catch us there. We also have a website. Our website is just informative just to tell you who we are, what are some of the things we're doing. And um, I just really hope that this could be a place where people feel encouraged, where they feel safe. Because I know right now, a lot of places are shut down. Right now, people can't, con you know, can't fellowship how they used to. And I'm hoping that we have um, a place that we can, you know, Connection Bible Fellowship could be a place where people can still fellowship. People can still learn about the Word of God. And that's my heart, is just to really give you the Word of God. I don't really want too much of my opinion even in this, I want really just the basic bones of the word of God, because I'm telling you, the word of God heals, it transforms, it uplifts for sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm so glad, Alex, that your daughter told you about that. Big ups to Alex's daughter. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm so happy that you uh, stopped by. Um, uh, if there's any... Um, you know, any any questions you have, anything. No question is dumb. No question is stupid. No question is like, oh, you should have known that. We need to ask questions. We need to ask questions. And God is not afraid of questions. There are so many times in the Bible that you see Moses asking God a question. You see uh, uh, Abraham asking God questions because God is not afraid of questions. He welcomes them. He welcomes them. He's given us a mind that's inquisitive, a mind that th that needs to think and figure things out. He knows that we're coming with the questions. And that's why he wrote this book, because we have all, he has all the answers. He has all the answers right there for us. So we don't have to walk around in this life confused and not knowing what's going on. We can walk around clear-minded, reading the word of God, using his uh, principles, using his, his wisdom for our life. Um, let me ask y'all a question. Um, any, who's, um, anybody got a favorite book of the Bible? Anybody got a favorite book of the Bible? Um, please put it in the chat. I, uh, my favorite book in the Bible is the book of James. And that's for the New Testament. And for the Old Testament is Proverbs. Proverbs, that's my dream right there. Ooh, you want to learn some things? You want to get some wisdom of the Lord right there? Ooh, that's my thing right there. I love those two. And... Um, my favorite chapter is Psalms 119. That right there, that thing, every time I read it, just brings me to tears. Just brings me to tears because God's word is so good. It's so good. So, um, oh, we got Laquanus says Psalms and Revelation. Oh, Revelation lover. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm also a Revelation lover. <laughs> Phoenix read Revelation like 15 times. No, not 15, but she read, how many times you read it? Um... I think this is my third or fourth time around. Oh my yeah. goodness, she loves it. She loves it. I love Psalms too. Psalms, oh, David is just like, that is a man after my own heart too. Like, he is so passionate and so, like, real. Like, he really be sad. Like, and he, don't, he don't mind. Like, when he crying, he said, I cry so much, I feel faint. And I can sure enough relate to that. I can sure enough relate to that. And I love that in the same Psalm, David can just, you know, be sad one minute, and then next year he says, but I remember. I remember the things you used to do for me, Lord. I remember how you brought me out. And then he just turned that thing into a glory praise. Oh, my goodness, David. I can't wait to see you in heaven. We're going to be talking. Proverbs 17, 3. Let's see. What's Proverbs 17, 3? 
You go right though. Never mind. It has it right there? Okay. Yeah, just put it in there. Let's go to Proverbs 17, 3 and see what we got. It says, Proverbs 17, 3 and see what we got. It says, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. But the Lord tests the hearts. Amen. 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 Yes. The Lord tests the hearts. And that is why we have to have our heart right. That our heart being right doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. Our heart being right doesn't mean we're not going to make mistakes. Our heart meet being right is that we're seeking after righteousness. That we're just, we love the Lord. And that's, we want to please him. That's our heart being right. Um, we have uh, another, we have, we have, um, Psalms 1, like a tree planted by the, by rivers of living water. Yes, Linda, yes. I love that. Ooh. And the roots just go down deep. You just soaking up that living water. I love that. I love that. Um, I think Alex posted, um, was it Alex posted? No. no, Patricia, Patricia posted Luke, um, 145, Luke 145. And it says, blessed is she who believed for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Amen. Amen. When you believe, you know, the Bible says without faith, without faith, it's impossible to please him. But when we believe in God, when we believe on the things that he has told us, he will make it come to pass. He will make sure to move whatever in the spiritual realm out your way because he already said it to you. He already told it to you and his word cannot come back void. His word can't. He can't deny himself. He can't even lie to himself. He can't. So whatever he told you, Patricia, you stand on that thing. You stand, even when the enemy tried to say, girl, he didn't tell you that. Girl, he was just, girl, he was just playing. You make sure that you stand on that no matter what. No matter what. Because once God said it to you, girl, that's it. That's it. That's all you need. That's your sign, seal, delivered. That's your seal of approval right there. I so love God. I love his word. I love the Lord Jesus. I love the fact that the Holy Spirit of God dwells within me. I'm telling you, we are truly blessed. If, you know, the, the old the old school people, you say, you know, if God doesn't do another thing for us, then, you know, we all right. We still good. If he don't do nothing else for me, if he just right here, this is all I got right here, just me and you, and that's it, then we still good. We're still good. And we're blessed because he is such a good God, such a good God. Oh, Alex is saying, heat the metal and the dross floats to the top. It is scooped off, which makes it the the gold. 10, oh, 20, 24. Okay. Oh, 10, 20. Yes, yes, yes. And that's exactly right, Alex, because that's exactly what God has to do for us. We were talking about that the other night about being put in the fire and taking the dross off, taking the dirt off and then putting it back in the fire because there's different levels. Like you said, the 10, the 20 the, and the 24 carat. And that's what he's doing with us. He's continually refining us. He's continually uh, molding us and shaping us to look more and more like Jesus. He's continually doing that. So sometimes when we're going through hardships, sometimes when we, you know, things don't work out the way that we want, it's because God is doing a work. He's refining us. He's taking off all that and all those impurities, all those things that was from the old life. And he's molding us into something greater, something better. He's perfecting us. And it's such, that's a blessing in and of itself to know that we are being perfected every day. That we're going to be as pure as gold. It's such a blessing. God is so good. He is so, so good. I'm telling you. If there's, you don't get nothing out of this, just know that God is good and God got you. He got you. You know, and, and let your faith, let your faith be, be the thing that sustains you. That belief. That's a lot of, that's the reason I, I was into a pastor earlier and I even, um, I'm, I'm in school for social work right now. And we were looking at anxiety in the DSM-4, which is the, the, the book they use to diagnose people with things, um, like mental health issues. And 
in the DSM-5, I'm sorry, I said DSM-4, in the DSM-5, it says that anxiety and fear are different. He said fear is about the present, like a real imminent danger, like the house is on fire, somebody's chasing me, the dog, the neighbor's dog is, you know, nipping at my heels. You know, that's fear because that's imminent. It's now, it's needed. Our bodies are made for that, that fight, flight, or freeze response. But anxiety is about a fear about things that have not happened yet. But guess what? Faith is the belief about things that have not happened yet. So fear and faith can be sometimes, you know, they're like opposite sides of the coin. So we have to turn our fear around and make sure that we're not feeding into these beliefs of things that did not occur. But we have to believe in God and what his word said about things that have not occurred. That's what faith is. Faith is about the future. Our faith is about thinking about the hope in God, the hope in Christ Jesus. That is where our faith gets strong at, is that we believe everything that God has written in his word. We will be at peace. We'll be at rest. We can relax. But we so fearful sometimes that it crushes our faith. Let your faith grow by believing and trusting in God. I see that um, Alex wrote, refine, refine me, Lord. Strengthen, me. strengthen me. In the process. Oh, strengthen me in the process. Yes, 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 Alex. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. We have to be strengthened. We have to be strengthened in the process. We don't want the process to take us out. And I'm, listen, I am a culprit of that. Oh, one time I was going through something and I kept crying, Lord, please take me out of this thing. Lord, please, I don't want to do this no more. Lord, Lord, please, please, I don't want to do this. I, I kept begging the Lord to take me out of something. and I. But even though I'm begging the Lord for that, I was still pressing in. Still trying to read his word, even through the tears. Even though the words look blurry because I'm still reading my word. But and as I'm doing that, I'm reading in one of my devotions and one of the devotions said, trust the process. Trust the process. Trust the process of being refined. Trust that he is the great refiner and that he's watching you while you're in the fire. He's with you while you're in the fire and he's not going to let you come out scorched. He's not going to let you do that. And I was sitting there like, then this means that there's a trust issue with me, with me and God, that I don't trust him. And I had to really address myself. I had to really think about that because that is one of the main issues that we don't trust God. We don't trust him. Deep down inside, we really be like, eh, he not going to do that thing he said he going to do. He really not going to bring me that spouse. He really not. I know he said, but um, I'm going to have to find a way to make that money. I'm going to have to do like an 80 hour work week right quick. Because I mean, my money's getting low. Money's getting funny. We don't really trust him. We think that we can outwork God. We think we can out matchmaker God. We think we can out uh, spend God. We really think that we have a plan. We really do, but we don't. Our plan is always obsolete. Always obsolete. So we have to make sure that we check ourselves from time to time and make sure that do we really trust God? Is our faith that crazy faith? That faith that don't let go? That faith that, you know, it's just like, okay, you want me to get out and hop on the donkey and go in? All right, I got you. I'm going is that, is, that, is our faith there yet? That we could just, whatever God say, that we just with it? And that is where we got to be. We got to keep pressing in. Keep pressing in. Yes, Alex says, when I'm being attacked, I know it's because I am headed in the right direction. And the enemy wants, uh, wants, to direct me. wants, wants, a, wants me, wants yeah, me down. Me down. And, uh, to redirect me mm -hmm. so push harder that in every direction absolutely in that very direction, in that very direction. i'm sorry i don't know i'm can't see <laughs> um i'm gonna let you read it from now on <laughs> um yes yes so true alex so true so true what what is that what is the verse when paul says you know we're 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 um crushed but not destroyed we pressed on every side you know 
And it feels like that sometime. But that's when we know we're the closest to God because he said he's close to a broken and contrite spirit. So even though we're being broken down and we're stressed out, we know that God is right there in the midst. He's right there with us. Right there with us. We just got to keep pressing and holding on. Pressing and holding on. So um, we got about 15 minutes. We got about 15 minutes um, left. I got about 15, 15 minutes left. Anybody have any questions out there? Anybody got any questions out there that um, you might need answered or want answered or anything that you ever thought about that was like, I wonder why. We had some really good ones last time. We were talking about the donkey talking and stuff like that. That was really fun. Um, let me see. What other things um, out there that's usually pretty interesting for me? Well, for me, we're going right now on Sundays. We're going through the um, we're going through a series on the Holy Spirit, and um, that was a big, big, a big um, question mark for me at some point. And um, you know, we can get into this later. But when we talk about the Holy Spirit, people normally think about speaking in tongues, and that's it. And they don't really like really understand the Holy Spirit is such an intricate part of our walk and our daily life. Without the Holy Spirit, we would not be guided. It says in the Bible that we are sealed, sealed to the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God. There's a seal on us in the spiritual realm. With that seal, that come, that's, that's like a stamp of approval. We all right. We good to go. And so learning, learning more about the Holy Spirit is very, very important for your walk. Yes, we, we know about God the Father. We know that Jesus died for our sins. But we really need to get down in, 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 in depth about talking about the Holy Spirit and his role in our life as a believer. Because without the Holy Spirit, we don't have that power. We don't have that power. We need that power. Because the enemy, when he come, we can't just stand with little old me. This, we talking about this is an angel. Satan used to be an angel. He still got the powers and stuff of an angel. He was the top one too. So I got to make sure that I got somebody bigger on my team. What the, what the Bible said when Jesus was saying, he said, when a strong man is in your house, you got to go get somebody stronger. So when the enemy's in your house and the enemy coming in like a flood, you just can't stand there by yourself. Talk about, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you. You need some power behind that. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He gives us that power. We have that authority now. Can you please talk about purpose? The purpose uh, of the wine press. Oh, yes, Linda. Thank you. That's a good one. That's a good one. Oh, the purpose of the wine press. So, <laughs> when... They are getting, I, I'm not sure which wine press, it's, it's two different ones. I know they talk about one in the book of Revelations, but I know that, you know, throughout the Bible, the, the wine press is used as a metaphor. And it's kind of almost like the same metaphor for um, uh, uh, the, uh, the refining. So when you have the wine press and you push, you, you, you put the whole grape in there you put everything in there and you're, you you want to get out the best you can get you want to get the best flavor out so you're going to keep pressing the, you turn it and as it's turning it's pressing down and what comes out is the, the juice not the pulp not the sea everything else gets left and so the same thing i would i would say is happening with us god wants the best out of us the best because he know what what we're capable of that's how he can, you know, he knows stuff that I don't know about myself. You know, I always think about um, when he told Gideon that he was a man of valor. And Gideon like, Lord, I don't even know what I'm doing. God sees us in a way that we don't even see ourselves. And so when we're in that wine press and those, you know, and it's kind of, things are pressing down on us. And, and, and we feel so down and heavy and downtrodden. Please understand that it's for our good. He's pressing us and allowing us to be pressed so that what comes out is the best of us. And with that best of us, he's going to take that little bitty bit of nothing and he's going to turn it into something so great, so beautiful, so anointed. 
that it that no one around us is going to be able to deny the power of God. Because I they're going to be like, Charmaine, I know you could have did this by yourself. I know, I know there has to be a God somewhere, Charmaine, because it's definitely not you. That is what it is like to live the life as a believer because sometimes we are in the wine press. We are being pressed. We are being refined. We're being separated from our old man and renewed in, in the new man. We're being regenerated. And when that process, as that process is happening, it does sometimes feel like a pressing. But what comes out of that is new wine. Something refreshing. What comes out of that is a blessing in our lives. Because we are being built up in Christ. We're being built up in the kingdom of God for his work. You have any, um, go ahead, Phoenix, so you know I can't read. <laughs> um, Alex said, so many are broken apart on whether the rapture or the tribulation and which one will be first. He said, all that matters is that uh, we are ready whenever. Alex, yes! Alex, you are 100%, 1,000% right. Listen, I can't sit here and tell you there are scriptures out there that support pre-tribulation. There's scriptures out there that support post-tribulation. There's scriptures out there that support, that support you know, because God knows. And, and, and his, in his writing, they're all together and they, they are going to make sense. They are going to make sense at the end of the day. But what I'm saying is that there's no need to focus on that. Because that's not going to save you. That's not salvation. When is it? When is it going to happen? First of all, he said, no man is going to know the day of the hour. No man is going to know the day of the hour. So why are we concerned? And, and, and I believe Matthew 24, I believe, or 25, when he was talking, when, when Jesus' disciples asked them, Lord, what's going to happen at the end? What's, how's it going to look like? And he gave them the whole rundown of things. And he said, I'm not telling these things to scare you. And I believe I said this other day, he's not, he doesn't tell us things to, to scare us, but to prepare us. He says, I'm not telling you these things to scare you, but when you see these signs, he wants you to look up because redemption draws nine. Look up. So we don't need to be looking down here, arguing with one another as brothers and sisters about when, it, when it's going to happen. We want to know, are you ready? Will you be ready when that trumpet sound? Will you be ready when he cracks the sky? Will you be ready? Are you going to be in the field and one is going to be left and the other one taken up? Are you going to be, you know, in your house, you're going to wake up and, and, and see, see your family members are going around you? Well, you don't want that. You want to be ready. So no matter when it's happening, is your house in order? And if it's not in order, get your house in order. Get it in order because I try to tell people. Yes, God is love. Jesus is love. Love, love, love. Love and grace. Grace and grace. Grace and love. They keep saying these things, right? But what they don't know, what they're not really understanding, what they're not really emphasizing, you know, you talk about little baby Jesus in the manger. Jesus, 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 you know, Jesus is no lonely old shepherd. But what they're not really emphasizing is that, that revelation, that revelation, that your man's coming back on a horse. Your man's coming back, back. For judgment. Your man's coming back for wrath. Your man is coming back and he's not playing with any of us. God is not playing with any of us. Jesus is not playing with any of us when he's coming back. He's not coming back as a baby in the manger. He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming back and he's so serious. So get your house in order. Because that is the main thing. Because you don't want him to crack that sky and you'll be sitting here. I don't. I don't. We got about like six minutes. Six minutes. Um, Laquanda asked, do you know about the missing scrolls from the Bible? Uh, like the book of Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene and stuff. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I'm, I'm in the process of reading um, a few of them. Um... I actually have all of them. I don't have the one with Mary, but I did rent it from the library once, and I did look it over and um, kind of skim through it. There, um, okay, when you look up the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are um, a lot of uh, books. Not a lot, like, you know, 20,000 or anything like that. But when you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, there were some scripture, scripture references and scriptures that were there that were not put into the Bible. And for me, 
I don't like anybody tampering with the, the word of God. I don't, if, if he said, don't touch nothing and leave it there, let God decipher and, and let the Holy Spirit lead us to what is right and what's wrong. That's just, this is my, this is where my personal opinion comes in. This is not God. This is my personal opinion. If those books were found with the Dead Sea Scrolls, all of those books should have been in there. There's no reason to take them out. Even if they have contradictory information, let the Holy Spirit lead people to what is real and what is not. Because there is a lot of information in there that is very important. That is true. And there's information in there that doesn't really line up with some of the scriptures that we are used to. But let the Holy Spirit lead us. Who, who are we, man, to say this scripture is, is okay or this book is okay and this book is not okay? We don't even know how to live in peace. But we're going to talk about, we're going to say what books is there, what books should not be there. That is not for us to say. So you're going to have a council of people and they just going to look it over and say, well, this one and that one. To me, that's control. And then where I'm from, I look at God and there's freedom. Freedom to choose and for, for me to seek God for direction and say, well, what about this word? This word doesn't seem right. I can even read some things and I can say, well, I can read some things in the Bible we have now. And I'd be like, mm, that might be more Paul than God. You know what I'm saying? I could do that because the Holy Spirit is leading me a certain way. So I'm de I definitely know about that. The book of Enoch, um, uh, the book of Idris. I think there's another one from uh, uh, Solomon in there. There's a, there's a lot. I have them on my bookshelf. I haven't gotten to all of them right now. I'm actually reading the book of Jasher. You know, all these different things. I don't know if it's authentic. You know, people say, it too, oh, it's not authentic. I don't know. Well, the Holy Spirit will lead me. The Holy Spirit will lead me. And I do use the Bible as my guideline. You know, the the one the, the Bible that we have, I use that as my guideline when I read these other books so that I could stay grounded in something. So I'm not just being cast around and thrown around with every wind of doctrine. But I do not think that they should have kind of left it out. All right. It's uh, 926. Um... Anybody have anything else to say? What was this? Oh, say? Alex was referring to when you were talking about revelations. Mm -hmm. He said, um, I don't think he could trust us with that information because we wouldn't get dressed for it until three hours before it comes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, Alex. That's a good one. Oh my goodness. All right. Um, I would, what was that? She said, I, I Oh, would, that's a, yeah. that's a, okay. All right, so um, we're going to um, close in prayer. Um, please, like I said, visit us on YouTube. It's Connection Bible Fellowship. We would totally, totally appreciate your prayers. Prayer does change things, so we would appreciate your prayers and your support in that area. Please go to YouTube, subscribe, like, comment. And, you know, um, also our, uh, on YouTube, you'll be able to find our um, website. If there's any type of... Um, email you want to email us and you know have some private conversations and things you want to talk about please email us um also if there's any prayer requests we would love to pray for you um please let us know um if there's any needs in the body we would like to pray for you and and, and lift you up before the lord um and so we're just gonna wrap it up we're gonna wrap it up i thank you all for coming out taking time out of your friday night to spend with us we so totally enjoyed you uh, we're so blessed by you and um, we're just going to continue on serving the Lord. And I pray that this was an encouragement and a blessing to you as well. And so um, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that uh, that you brought whoever came today. You brought those that you knew needed to hear this, Lord. You brought those who needed the encouragement, those who needed the fellowship, Lord. So we just thank you for this time, Lord. It's such a blessing to be around people who love you, to be around people who uh, are, are inquisitive and want to learn more about you, oh God. And so we're so thankful for that, Lord. We pray that this word or any words that was spoken today, Lord, just bring encouragement to people and, and fills their hearts, oh God. Lord, please continue your work in us. Please continue to mold us and shape us and put us through the wine press. Put us through the refiner's fire. Lord, please continue to grow us, Lord, so that we can be mighty in your kingdom for your service, oh God. And so we thank you and we praise you. We lift your name on high. We give you glory and, uh, and glory and honor. And we ask these things in Jesus Jesus and mighty and precious name. Amen. 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 Thanks everybody for coming out.
Love you. Have a good night. Mwah, 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 mwah.